everyone. This is Iyad Murtada, and on behalf of the IMA Dubai chapter, I would like to welcome you here today for our uh, webinar for this month. Today, our webinar is related to uh, interviewing tips. And last time we went over some um, tips related to CV writings. Today, this is the second section where we are going to cover most of uh, the interview tips and techniques that you can use when you are looking for a job. And today, here we have with us Mr. Brad. Uh, Brad uh, Boyson, he is uh, the HR manager for Amar Group, and at the same time, he's helping us with many of the webinars that we are conducting with the IMA. So I'm just going to leave now the mic to Mr. Uh, Brad, and at the same time, here is the first question for the webinar. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to be back to talk to you. As Iyad said, I'm going to be talking about interviewing today. Last time we talked about CV writing. Uh, I'm pretty certain that most of you, if not all of you, will get something out of this session. I've tried my best to cover some of the basics that uh, we talked about last year, but for the most part focus on aspects that are subtle, uh, unique elements of the interview process. I've broken today's session into three parts. The first part, part one, will be interview standards the basics, the how of the interview, how it works, at least on the surface. Part two, the job interviews, the why. Now, this is something that doesn't come up a lot, but I think it's extremely valuable for you to understand some of the subtle details that go into the interview process. In essence, what we're talking about is getting below the surface. And what I'm going to do is rank the information that I give you in terms of good, better, and best. So a good interviewer will do uh, one thing, a better interviewer will do another thing, and the best interviewers do something else. And then at the end, uh, we'll leave some time as well to answer your questions to the best of my ability. The objectives today, we're going to review the essentials. I want you to get an enhanced perspective in terms of the interview process. This will empower you to, empower you to understand better why certain things are done in the interview process. In that process, hopefully you'll get some tips on how to improve your interviewing skills and also understanding the critical reasoning because this is a really important point for you to think about. You often don't think about it, I'm sure, but how an organization recruits people reflects that organization's values in terms of its employees. Okay? looks like uh, from the question that most of the uh, audience here with us today, just let me show the results of the first question. looks like 82% of the people who are here looking for a job, so that's great. I think this webinar is going to be very good for you if you are going for a job interview and it will help you really land the job that you want. I agree. Thank you, Yo. Just uh, before we get into the interviewing, I think one of the most common questions that I saw in the last session related to people asking, well, okay, we'd like to address an email uh, to a, a particular person, a name. How do we get that name? Uh, call the organization. You don't have to necessarily talk to the recruiter or to the HR person. You can talk to the receptionist. Just call them and say, I'd like to send in my CV. I'd like to address the CV to the head of HR or the head of recruiting. Could you please give me their name? And, and don't ask, don't forget to ask for the spelling too. You've got them on the line. And trust me, 99% of organizations will be more than happy to give you that information. There was one other thing I found on the internet uh, since our last webinar, and it was a quote from Mark Zuckerberg. And we were talking about networking, if you remember from the last webinar. And he had an interesting point, is that you get your most valuable new information from your network not from your first circle of connections, but from your second circle of connections. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. The people that you connect with first are the people who are most like you. So they're going to have a very similar perspective, a similar group of contacts. It's the connections between the two of you that can potentially add the most value to your network. And if you're interested in uh, reading the article, the link is here. And uh, I encourage you to look that up as well. One other piece that I found on the internet that I thought was quite interesting and quite new is there is a add-on for the Chrome browser. I'm sure in time it'll work on other browsers. It, the website is called whoworksat.com. 
And how it works is once you install it into your browser, if you're surfing the internet anywhere and you're on a page for a website, and it could be, it could be Google, it could be IBM, it could be Microsoft, any company, if you click on the little icon, what it will do is actually show the people on LinkedIn that are in your immediate network. So if you're curious and looking into more details to build your network, it's, a, it's an interesting direction that the internet is going in terms of networking and software. So I encourage you to check out both of those resources. This was a fascinating uh, piece of information that came on the internet about two weeks ago. And I'm not sure if any of you saw this, but I talked in the last session about how much time a recruiter spends looking at a CV the first time. And I myself would have, if you'd asked me without checking with other people, I would tell you anywhere between four and maybe 10 seconds the first time. That's not a lot of time. What's fascinating about this is this website, businessinsider.com, is they actually did research and, and connected to the uh, visuals of what recruiters look at when they look at the CV for the first six seconds. And as you can see in this picture where there's the red and the orange is where they're looking. Said another way, where there's no red or orange, they're not looking there. In six seconds, those are the spots that they're looking at. So one thing you'll also notice about this uh, picture is that wherever there's too much information, they're not looking at. Right? The information is where it's in bullet points, very clear, easy to read, easy to access. So again, the website is listed here, businessinsider.com. If you have a chance, uh, the article that accompanies the research is also there as well. So just to recap, at the beginning of the last session, I asked you, what is the purpose of the CV? And then the answer is, is to get a job interview. And the reason that's important is because people will spend a lot of time perfecting their CV when they should be spending more time working on their interviewing skills or their networking skills. But I did have a little twist in the previous question where I said, previously I asked you, what is the purpose of the interview? I'm qualifying that this time and asking or, or stating to you, what is the purpose of the first job interview? Because that's what I'm going to talk about today, is the first job interview. And the purpose of the first interview is to get that second or final interview. Very seldom are job decisions made simply on one interview. So if you've made it to the first interview, which we're going to talk about today, realize that your goal isn't necessarily to get the job at that point. It is the skills to make it to the next step. And that's how I'm going to focus my discussion. Uh, preparing for this webinar got me thinking about you know, my own perspective. You know, where do I come from to develop these sort of patterns and uh, sort of conclusions and, and information that I give you? Well, I sort of did a bit of number calculation. And if you average it out, if you say I do one interview a day, a working day, uh, some days I'll do more, some days I'll do none. But on average, one interview, five days work week, 45 weeks a year you know, over my career, some places working more or less, over 15 years, that adds up to over 3,000 separate interviews that I've done. Those are unique individuals that I've spent anywhere between probably 10 and 20 minutes with, with a one-on-one -on -one interview process. So this, when I give you this information today, this is where I'm deriving this information from. But probably what's just as unique about that, given where we live here in Dubai and in the UAE in this region, is I checked off the different nationalities that I'm certain that I have interviewed over the past uh, 15 years. And we know that we have a lot of diversity in the UAE in terms of different nationalities. But I've literally worked all over the world and have interviewed people from at least 120 different nationalities. And what's my general conclusion? Well, there are universal patterns and standards of interview success. As different and unique as we are, there are patterns. And I encourage you to take the information I give you today and use it to your advantage. Job interview itself, let's be honest, is not the job, is it? It's not the job. So how does an interview correlate to being good at a job? Well, it doesn't. You know, people talk about issues of fairness or maybe people with the most charisma get the jobs or people with personal connections get the jobs. Sometimes there's discrimination in the workplace. The point is, is an interview is a form of measurement. That's what it is. 
It's a measurement process, and it's one of many measurements that are taken in terms of an organization assessing whether or not to uh, hire a candidate. And here's the, the final point on this slide is good interviewers and better organizations will focus on the job requirements and the fit as it relates to you and the organization that you're applying for. So yes, these other factors come into play, but you're a valuable asset. And when you're being interviewed, you should uh, acknowledge that fact that you have a lot to offer to an organization. Another point that's, uh, I've done talks on this subject before and people have said, well, you know, if you as the interviewer give away all of your tricks, wasn't that like giving away the answers? You know, doesn't that ruin the interview process? Absolutely not, and I'll tell you why. There's no answers, like a test. There's no answers in a real job interview because you cannot assess organizational fit simply from a checklist. You can't. The other element is that the goal is to compare candidates. That's something that we often forget about when we're in the interview process. When I'm interviewing you for the first interview, I'm not selecting you for the job. I'm deciding what are the differences between you and other people that I've met with for this job. That's where my head's at, right? One of the things as well is that the key differences between people are never found in the first information they give you. So if I ask you a question and you give me a response, I'm not as interested in that answer as to when I asked you the follow-up question, which I don't know what that's going to be until you give me your information. So even though there's a pattern and a foundation to how this starts, to get to the real useful information as an interviewer, you have to dig for it. And as I said, you just you don't know what the follow-up questions that I will ask as the interviewer will be until you give me your answer. So Interview, it's not a checklist. It said another way, if you're ever in an interview and someone's got a checklist and they're checking it as they go through the interview with you, you know that they're not a competent interviewer. It's just simply a fact. So starting with part one, the basics of the interview process. Interview preparations. These are the things that you should be doing as the interviewer before the interview starts. Research the organization. We talked about that in the last webinar. You need to get the details of the organization that you're going to be interviewing with. Research the interviewer. You know, we talked about last time in the sense of how you present yourself in terms of your CV, in terms of your online presence. Organization, I'm going to be looking, if I'm going to interview you, I'm going to be looking at, deeper into your background. If you're coming into an organization, you should be looking into the organization too. It works both ways. Visit the location prior. Now this one may not seem like a big priority, and sometimes it's not, but there's two reasons for it. The first reason I'll give you relates to say, I'll give you an example of my most recent uh, position. My office was located at MR Business Park. I'm sure if I told a lot of you MR Business Park, you'd say, I know exactly where that is. But there's another location in Dubai called MR Square. Have any of you heard of that as well? Right? I can't tell you how many times I've told people who are coming in for an interview with me that we're at MR Business Park. And I would say it's not a lot, but at least between 2 and 3% of the time, someone will go to the other location. That is not a good first impression. You know, if I've been very clear as to the location, you should know where that location is. But the other reason that it's worth going to the location is to get a sense of the environment, the work environment. And specifically what I'm referring to here is the uh, dress code. Uh, different organizations have different work codes for all kinds of different things. Dress code is important in terms of the interview because it reflects how you present yourself as the potential person to fit within the organization. You should dress the same way that the organization is dressing. So if it's a very casual environment, you know, a lot of technology companies have very casual work environments, then it's okay to be casual. If it's a very formal environment, you should dress formally. How do you know that? Unless you actually go to the environment. 
prepare questions in advance based upon your research. So don't just do the research to find out information about the organization. Part of the reason you're doing the research is you should be creating questions that you're going to ask in the interview. Asking the interviewer questions is one of the best ways for you to show the organization that you're serious, that you've done your research. And the types of questions tell a lot about your type of person. If someone says, what are the benefits of the organization? If that's the first question that I hear them ask me, I've drawn some conclusions about this person. If they ask me a different question and say something like, oh, why, you've been with this company for four years now. Why do you stay? That's a good question. That will give me a lot of information as the candidate about the organization. And that's part of the purpose. You're interviewing the organization just as much as they are interviewing you. So step two, arriving to the interview. So you've done your preparatory work. You're going to the location now for the interview. My first piece of advice is reconfirm the appointment. Very easy. You can send an email. You can do a phone call. In this day and age, I'd recommend an email. Why? Well, how many times do you have appointments that change? It's quite frequent, isn't it? You think about it. And it's especially more frequent for the interviewer to have other obligations in business come up. So aside from making sure that the interview happens, the other reason you do it is it shows a level of planning and professionalism. You're marketing yourself by doing this. You're marketing yourself. Be on time. This is an interesting one. We live in a, an emirate, in a region of the world where there's so many different cultures. And cultures have a different perception of time. For some cultures, time is whenever. For other cultures, Time is a science. Time is like numbers. It doesn't vary. And you're either on time or you're not on time. So what my advice to you is, is that be on time. In other words, be a little bit early. Why? Because if someone doesn't care, there's no loss. But if someone does care, it's a lot like spelling and grammar in a CV and a cover letter. If someone cares, why would you harm your chances to present yourself in the best possible way? Be on time. It's the safe thing to do. Turn off your phone. How many times in movies and other locations are we told to turn off the phone? And I guarantee you, uh, and you've seen it, I'm sure, too. You've been in a movie and a phone goes off. Well, we're in a job interview. And when a phone goes off in a job interview, it is distracting at a minimum. At another extreme, it's quite disrespectful, too, because the organization, not just the person, but the organization is giving you their time to interview you. And you haven't given it your full attention. Worse yet, and this happens, it's one of those things that you say, don't do this. But I'm telling you as an interviewer, this happens. Not only will sometimes the phone ring, but people will answer it in the middle of an interview. Don't do that. You know, if it rings, if it vibrates, just turn it off. And the interview is only going to be another 10, 15, 20 minutes max. You can return the call at that time. Bring a copy of your CV. Uh, the interviewer should have a copy of your CV. I myself make a lot of notes on the initial copy. But there will be times sometimes where maybe I misplaced it. Uh, it looks very professional. So you should bring a copy of your, and your questions. You've gone through the work of creating and researching questions for this interview process. Don't forget to bring your questions. Um, this slide's covered a bit, but it's, what it's saying is be nice to the people in the work environment. Now, why would I say that? You know, it's common sense, but I can't tell you how many times people will come into a workplace and they walk through a door and they cross paths with someone. That someone may actually be the person that the second interviewer is with. And as the interviewer, Often what I will do to get more information about a candidate that, I, uh, that seem to present themselves well, I will actually ask people that they, in, that they interacted with, maybe a reception, uh, maybe an office boy, some position. How is this person? Because if they're going to come into our organization, I want to know how they are, not just with the interviewer, but in general. So you never know who's an important person when you're going into a new workplace setting.
All of these things add up to one thing, and that is being professional. Everything on this list is about being professional. During the interview, step three. Are you nervous? Yeah. Who isn't nervous? But ask yourself, why are you nervous? One of the reasons people get nervous in an interview is because it is a very unfair situation. The person that you're sitting across from has something you want. They have the potential to offer you a job that you want. That is a form of power. And that inequity in that relationship is uncomfortable, at a minimum. Acknowledge that fact. There's nothing wrong with just simply realizing that that's part of what makes you uncomfortable. That's fine. People get nervous. It's to be expected. Some things that you can do to help yourselves not be nervous. One is realize that the interviewer is going to manage the interview process. You don't have to you know, control the situation. So let them control the situation. Take notes. Use your notes. You've brought questions with you. One way that you can remind yourself of the things that you want to remind yourself about is to look at your notes. Why not? Or take notes. If, they're, if the interviewer is talking and you have something comes to your mind that you want to remember that you tell them, rather than interrupt them, write it down. Be calm. There's no reason to rush into these types of things. Be truthful. We talked about this with the CV and the cover letter. It, it is so important. How many of you saw what's in the news in the past two, three days about the CEO of Yahoo? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? No? The CEO of Yahoo, it has come up that it's alleged that he embellished his CV to include the fact that he has a degree in computer science, when in fact he has a degree in accounting. Now, at the time where he's reaching the peak of his career, this has come out, and I don't know if he'll be CEO next week. Be truthful. We live in a day and age where there are so many paper trails and information to follow up on your background. If you are good at what you do and you will be successful, these are the types of things that will come back to hurt you. There's just no benefit to you. So be truthful. Smile. Body language. These are two really basic issues. But these are things that you should think about. The energy that a person gives off when they smile is universal. Every culture has the same feeling when it comes to a smile. A smile is a universal feeling. So incorporate that in your plan for the interview. Be aware of your own body language. This is a quote that I saw several years ago, and it just sort of sums up this slide in general. Failing to plan is planning to fail. What you're doing is coming to this interview with a plan. This plan will not only make you less nervous, it will increase your chances. During the interview, so what I'm going to list now is four or five standard questions. These, are, these aren't the actual questions, but these are the essence of the questions you can almost be guaranteed you'll be asked. Good example, why do you want to work here? You know, what, what is your motivation? You come in for an interview, why do you want to work here? Why did you or are you considering leaving your current job? These are, you need to have an answer for this. These questions will be asked for you. What the interviewer is trying to get at is your underlying motivation. You know, you're changing, you're looking to change, why? Does that fit with the organization that you're looking to apply for? What is unique or special about you? We talked about this in terms of the CV in the cover letter. This type of question will be asked to you, and you need to think about how you're going to answer it. Strengths and weaknesses. We know this one's coming, right? This is the standard of interview processes. It's such a standard that people say, well, don't even ask it. Well, you can ask this type of question in different ways. There are two questions. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Relates a lot to the previous example. When we're talking about your strengths, we're saying, what's special about you? Why should we as an organization select you relative to all the other people that we're going to interview? What is special about you? There's nothing. Well, then that's fine too. But 
Next, you know, let's move on to the next interview then. No, if you want this, you need to think about what's different. And I guarantee you, there is something special about everyone. You may have people that you look up to that are your superiors, that are more experienced or have more education. But there's people who look up to you, I guarantee you. Ask yourself, if someone looks up to me, maybe a younger family member, what is it about, what is it they, they see in me? That's an example of what would be a strength. A weakness, why is this question asked? Uh, there's several reasons. One of them is from an interview point of view, you want to see if the person is really self-aware about themselves. So strengths is one end of the question. Weaknesses are, you know, how honest are you with yourself? Uh, it is a good way also of demonstrating as a candidate that you recognize areas that you need to improve. And you can talk about that as well in the interview. Any restrictions on your hours of work? This question, what it's really getting at is trying to, what, are, what is it in your personal life that may affect your work life? That's what this question is getting at. And again, be honest. You don't have to give away too much information. But when I say be honest, the reason I say that is because most organizations, if you're a good employee, they will be flexible related to your requests. It doesn't mean that if it's a full-time job, you can request part-time work. No, no, no. What it means is that, let's say you've got a family uh, wedding in two months. Let them know about that in the interview. It's a very candid way. It will, if they like you, these types of things will never eliminate you from the position. But if you start a job, and then one week into the job, you say, oh, by the way, I have a family wedding in two months, that's not a good way to present that information. So if the question comes up, uh, best to be honest, but not give too much information. Step three during the interview. Questions again, but these are a different type of questions. These questions are generally labeled as situational or behavioral questions. It's a different type of question designed to get a different type of information. An example of these types of questions would be, describe a time you had to deliver on an impossible deadline. What was the project? What was the outcome? Another example would be, give me an example of a conflict that you've had with another employee in the workplace. What was the issue? What was the outcome? Tell me about your proudest work accomplishment. What was it and why? Now, if you analyze these questions, the reason that they are so powerful, and these are just examples. There's many different ways that you can ask a question that is based on a situation or a behavior. One reason it's powerful is because it's very hard to fake real experience. So if you've had a real experience and you tell that story, it will be received as a real experience. Said another way, if you don't have this experience, if I ask someone, uh, what, what, how did you handle a situation where you had, were in control of the budget and at the last minute your budget was cut? When someone who's had that experience tells you what they did, you can tell that it's real. Said another way, when someone who hasn't had that experience, you feel like you're getting a story. You feel like they're telling you a story. So behavioral and situational questions help the interviewer separate the candidates with actual experience from those who don't have the experience. You're going to answer that question. But again, you, if you think deep about these types of questions, if you're answering that question, if I ask you what it's like to be in a northern climate where there's lots of snow and uh, You've never been there before. If you've never been there before and I ask you to describe it to me, trust me, as a Canadian, you're going to have a tough time convincing me that you know what it's like to be stranded in the snow. But if you have, you will be able to tell this story of that experience and it will come across as having depth and truth. It also allows for a demonstration of critical thinking skills. So if you think about some these questions that I've listed, um, how you handle these situations will also demonstrate what you, how you handle the situation that had a bit of conflict, had a bit of stress. Who hasn't had restrictions or constraints on their decision making at work? How do you handle that? That's what these types of questions will help the interviewer find out about.
things to never do in the interview. Never talk poorly of a previous employer or boss. It's about being professional. Remember, this isn't a personal discussion you're having. This is a professional discussion. Said another way, if you're going to talk bad about the boss, how are you going to talk about me when we work together? You know, it, it's, it's very uh, unprofessional. Never hedge by giving vague answers. I see candidates on occasion in an interview, they're worried so much about giving the right or wrong answer that they give very general answers. Well, how am I supposed to know what's different about you if everything that you say is a very general information? Another way of talking about that point is sometimes I'll ask a very specific question and people will give a very general answer. Again, that's being vague. I'm trying to help you differentiate yourself to me. You know, be specific. Talked a bit earlier about the strength weakness questions. You will find people and advice online in books. There will be people who say, you know what? They're going to ask you a question about your weaknesses. You know what you do? Take something that's not really a weakness and pretend that it is a weakness. Right? Flip it around and say, oh, you know what my weakness is? I'm a workaholic. Right? As an interviewer who's done over 3,000 interviews, when those types of answers come to me, I just feel like the person is being disingenuous. I don't, I don't want to say I feel insulted. That's too strong. But if you're a workaholic, compared to what? Compared to, I don't know, uh, Bill Gates when he was starting Microsoft? Compared to Steve Jobs? Or compared to uh, your cousin who doesn't have a job? Right? It's a very relative answer. And a relative answer is a vague answer. And it has no value. So don't play games with the strength or weakness question. Think about what your weakness is, things, areas. The best way that you can turn it into a positive is think about the things that you're doing to improve yourself. You know what's a really good example? We live in Dubai. We live in the UAE. Uh, Arabic is one of the official languages, obviously. Most of us speak English as a second language. If you want to fit in to Dubai, and into the UAE more, you could say, you know what, I speak English and maybe another language, but I don't speak Arabic. I live in Dubai and I don't speak Arabic. That's one of my weaknesses. But you know what I'm doing? I'm, uh, I've bought some uh, online software that is teaching me Arabic. That's an example of how to take a weakness question and make it positive. Because that is a weakness. It's a very sincere and real weakness. But it's how you turn it into that positive that, that uh, makes all the difference. Never answer without knowing how your answer ends. Now that point form on itself may not make a lot of sense, but I'll give you the example. It doesn't happen a lot, but I've asked questions to people before, and they've given me the answer, and they go on and they go on, but they've never thought about where the answer is going. And in the end, it turns out what they told me was actually incredibly negative to their application. I interviewed a service worker once in customer service, and I was asking, how did you deal with a disgruntled uh, customer once? And he was telling me this story, how he did this extra service and this and this, and he went on. He was so proud of himself. And then towards the end, and he said, and you know what else happened is that uh, because I did this, I got to get the, the tip from my colleague so that they didn't get any tip. You know, the, the gratuity, the extra payment. And I don't know if he even realized what he had just said to me. But obviously, he was going in a direction with an answer and didn't think about where it was going. And as a team player, it made him look very poor, very poor. After the interview, ask for the job. You've just gone through an interview process. It doesn't say at the end, say, you know, please give me the job. What I'm saying is now is the opportunity to reinforce your interest in the job. Uh, Say something, you know, after this interview, I'm even more interested in working for your organization. I look forward to the next step. That, as an interviewer, I don't know what you're thinking. I know what I'm thinking. Give the interviewer that information if, if you want to give them that information. Ask for a business card. How basic is that? You know, that gives you their name, their position, their contact information. And who knows what the future holds? Maybe they become part of your network. Maybe you don't get that job. 
But there you go. There you have that piece of information that allows you to create uh, a trail of your network. Send a thank you email, usually the next day. And one of the reasons why this is so valuable, let's say you've gone home and you've thought about the interview and the issue came up and you said to yourself, oh, I don't know if I was clear on that issue. Sending a thank you email, not only is it respectful and professional, it gives you a chance to slip some more information into the interview, right? Oh, and by the way, you know, on this issue where I said that um, I'm taking courses at night to improve my auditing skills, that course doesn't start for another six months. So if I join your organization, it won't interfere with my becoming familiar with your organization. Excellent opportunity to introduce new information based on the interview after the fact. Follow up if there's no feedback. By that I mean, uh, let's say you haven't heard anything within a week. Does that mean they've made their decision? I don't know. Does that mean they're not going to have you come for a second interview? I don't know. Do you know? How do you know unless you ask? So do follow up with them. Uh, it could just be simply that since your last interview, they've been so busy with other things, they haven't actually moved to the next step of the interview. Don't assume that no information is bad information. I can't stress that enough. Sometimes it's just as the interviewer and the organization, you get taken on to other issues that come up and you don't have the opportunity to come back to the interview process until later on. So remember, as I said at the outset, the first interviewer and their questions aren't designed to get you the job, to select you for the position. They're designed to separate you from the other people that the person will interview. That's it. It's a comparison between people you've never met. That's what's happening in the interview process. Failing to do the basics that we've just gone through hurts you. It hurts your chances. Everything that I've just listed in terms of basics are things that are easy to do. But so many people don't do it. And all of those people who don't do it, they are hurting their chances to move to the next step. In the interview, what if? What if the question of compensation or pay comes up? You need to be prepared for that. That can come up. There's no specific answer that I can give you in terms of how to deal with that, other than to say, at some point, compensation will come up in an interview process. It's expected, trust me, as an interviewer, it's expected that if I ask you what your compensation expectations are, 80% of people will overstate what their expectations are. I already expect that. 5% will understate it. There are people who do that, trust me. I've done performance appraisals. And you would be surprised how many people, when they do their own self-appraisal, actually rate themselves lower than you rate them. It's the same with the compensation question. What, I'm, what, what my, in, my suggestion to you is, is be honest in the sense of something that you would accept and don't overstate it. There's a very good chance that the interviewer knows what the job market is for the position. They know what their budget is for that position. If you get too aggressive in terms of your salary expectations, you may eliminate yourself even though you're their preferred candidate. What if during the interview, the interviewer does all the talking? That happens. You know what that means? That means one of two things. It means either the interviewer is very inexperienced. They may be nervous. That happens too. What it usually means is that they've actually made up their mind based on very superficial information. Maybe they've got your CV, they've seen you, they listen for you for one minute, and there are people out there who will draw conclusions about people based on that. Trust me, in all of the interviews that I've done, people have, sometimes they've impressed me at the very beginning and then had a really terrible interview afterwards. Other times people have unimpressed me at the outset, but then at the end, they said something, they've communicated information that's been incredibly impressive. So what that taught me is never jump to conclusions. The interview is a process, go through the interview process. If someone's talking and talking and talking, that usually means they've already decided whether or not they're going to recommend you for the next step or not. You need to decide based on the feedback that you're getting from them. 
the words that they're using, their body language. It could be to your favor. That can be true. So maybe you don't want to do anything about that. Just let it go. But if you feel like they've drawn conclusions about you in the wrong way that are not going to help you, you need to critically assess whether or not you need to put more information about yourself into the interview process. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's something for you to think about. What about inappropriate questions? You know, everyone has their own values, their own morals, their own standards. You're interviewing the organization as much as the organization is interviewing you. And if you're being asked a question that makes you feel uncomfortable, there's nothing that requires you to answer it. Doesn't mean you have to be rude. Doesn't mean you have to be uh, taken aback. Uh, you need to decide in that circumstance what you're going to do. But make no mistake, how you receive that is, uh, is part of your process of interviewing the organization. What about if it's unexpectedly a group interview? You expect to come in and interview with one person and you're interviewing with five people. Or there's a bit of a stress interview where the questions that are asked to you are quite demanding in terms of uh, you know, what would you do in this situation? How would you handle this? Best I can say is these things do happen. You need to be prepared for it. As I said earlier on, the best organizations, the best interviewers focus on the specifics of the job and your fit within the organization. They're not going to get into these types of interviews at the beginning. Depending on the job, it may be more appropriate later on if someone's being interviewed for uh, a police officer or some other sort of job that requires proof of their ability to handle stressful situations, and yes, it makes a lot of sense to get into that. So we've talked about the basics. Everything that I've described to you so far, I put in the category of basics. Part two, I want to give you some insight into the interview process. Go below the surface, and I'll do it sort of at three levels. One will be, we'll talk about the basics. These are the things that are common standards in an interview process. Then we'll talk about the next steps. These things are popular but less common in the interview process. And then we'll talk about what I call deep cuts. These are unappreciated but incredibly invaluable uh, aspects of the interview process for you to understand. So let's start with the interviewer. A good interview, and again I'm going to go good, better, and best. A good interviewer will outline the structure and the plan of the interview at the beginning. That's how they'll start it. They'll say, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions at first. I'll give you some time at the end if you have any questions. And it'll last roughly 15 minutes. Someone tells you that at the beginning of an interview, right away you know you're talking to someone with a bit more experience. A good interviewer will never give basic information to you. They will never explain to you what the company is that you've come in for an interview. You should know that. You should do your research. If someone's starting to give you that information, uh, part of what they're telling to you is that they're actually starting to market the job to you. They're telling you that they're actually interested in you. So now they're giving you information. A good interviewer won't do that. A good interviewer will always use open-ended questions. Maybe you've heard of this before. Open-ended questions are questions that start with words like who, what, where, how, why. That is the main one, why. An open-ended question, said another way, an open-ended question can never be answered with yes or no. Those are close-ended questions. If I ask you a question, uh, did you go to university? It's a yes or no question, isn't it? But if I ask you, where did you go to university? You can't say yes, right? Open-ended questions are the way the interviewer gets more information from a question. A good interviewer will listen actively. Trust me when I say, if someone is a good interviewer, it is an incredibly demanding experience because you are paying attention to every little detail that the person is communicating to you. A good interviewer will probe inconsistencies. That's another thing that they do. If something you say is not consistent, they will dig deeper into that issue. A better interviewer, well, they'll use a script and take notes. But you know what? They make it seem like there's no script. I've done over 3,000 interviews. They're 95% the same. 95%.
But I do my very best to make sure every time that I interview someone that it's a different experience for them. Why? Because if I give them the information and it's just a process, that it's just a checklist, they give me the same type of information back. I need to dig deeper. So part of that is having a structure. A structured interview has an outline. You know, I sort of refer to it like a script. But a good interviewer will never make you feel like you're going through a script. A better interviewer will customize the behavioral and situational questions. Now remember earlier we talked about these types of questions. When I say customize, what I mean is that they will actually take a current situation in the workplace that you would have to deal with if you got this job and ask you how you would deal with it. Why is that useful to know? Because they're telling you about what the job entails. They're giving you inside information as to what you can expect if you get this job. So it's not just a question, it is inside information. How you answer the question will be relevant to them because they're thinking about how you're, how you're answering it relative to a real world situation in the job, in the organization. A better interviewer, as I mentioned, will ask why a lot. And I do mean a lot. Uh, some of you, if you've got a background in quality, you may have heard of uh, the five whys. Anyone that familiar in quality control? They say if you ask why five times, you can get to the root cause of a problem, an issue. So asking why, if I asked you, why do you want to come and work for our organization? And you say, well, because your organization has an excellent reputation. I say, well, why is that important to you? Well, all of a sudden, it's getting deeper, isn't it? Well, you know, I, I've tried to work for good organizations, and I believe that my career will be well suited by having organizations that are similar to my own personal education experience. Why? Well, um, you see how it gets deeper and deeper? It doesn't matter if I give you every single question that I'm going to ask you in an interview, because my second question is going to be why. And my third question is going to be why. And maybe even my fourth question is going to be why. There's no script for that. And it helps me get to the root of your personal motivation. And pause frequently. This is a really important one that skilled interviewers will use. Because they will pause. Why? Because when you pause, that silence is a gap. And for some people, not everyone, in certain cultures, Silence makes people uncomfortable. And if you're being interviewed and you're giving information and you hear nothing, one of the first conclusions that we come to is, I didn't give the right information. I'm going to give more. That's what people do. So a good interviewer will pause and wait. And trust me, people give so much information in that pause. Sometimes information that they wish they didn't give, but it is a very powerful tool in getting information. Ask some questions in the third person. Here's an example of what I mean by that. How would your boss describe your work to me? I could just ask you, how, how describe yourself as a worker. But if I say to you, how would your boss describe you as a worker to me? What that does is actually sort of lowers your walls of protection. And it makes you sort of think about how you're perceived by other people. And what that does is give me more truthful information than if I just asked you directly, tell me about yourself as a worker. Ask, it's, it's not something you want to do a lot in the interview process, but you should do at least two of these types of questions. The best interviewers. So we've been talking about what good interviewers do, what better interviewers do. The best interviewers will revalidate previous questions. For those of you with research backgrounds, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you create a survey, part of the way you give validity to the survey is you ask a similar question later on in a different way to make sure that the person is paying attention to the survey, that they're giving you consistent information. An interviewer can do exactly the same thing. What's the wrong type of work for you? That's an example of the type of question that revalidates. We've started this interview by asking you, why do you want to work here? What are you good at? What's different about you? 
And then all of a sudden I ask you, what's the wrong type of work for you? You describe the job that you're interviewing for right now. You're giving me information that says everything that you've said before is inconsistent. You just want a job. I remember I was, this was quite recently, a few months ago, I was interviewing someone for a call center job. And I asked this person this question. And their answer was, I'm not very good at outbound calls. That's the wrong type of work for me. They didn't even realize that they just said, this is the wrong type of job for me. This type of work, working in a call center. So that revalidating the previous questions is one way that you get more information. The best interviewers will ask a poorly worded, maybe a run-on question. Now, what I mean by that is that there's several, you wouldn't do it more than once. But what type of information you can get from a lot of people, if the primary language in the workplace is English, and we're in a market like Dubai in the UAE, where English is often a second language, the skill of English is something that the organization wants to know and assess about you as a candidate. One way you can do that in an interview is you can ask a bad question. I don't mean inappropriate. A bad question is one that just runs on and on and on and it just keeps going and it doesn't seem to have a period, it never comes and it just goes on and on and on. For those of you who speak more than one language, you know that one of the challenges is holding information together so that you can get to what the meaning is. It's a way to test someone's English uh, comprehension. And you ask a long run-on question. Poorly worded? Maybe you want to test the person's self-confidence. If you ask a question that you know that doesn't make sense, and they don't give you any sort of feedback that says, can you, can you say that again? Can you repeat that in a different way? I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you meant by that question. All three of those are demonstrations of confidence in the interview process <coughs> in a very uncomfortable way. If someone does that to me, right away they're telling me that they have element of strength and self-confidence, and that's a good thing. Obtain references from sources not provided. Remember I said in the, in the CV, when we talked about giving references or providing them in the CV, uh, the best interviewers aren't going to ask for your references because they're going to go ask the people, they're going to do their research into your background and ask people who aren't your references. Because there's probably a good chance the people that you give as references are people who like you, who will recommend you. So I'm assuming the references you give me are people who fall in that category. I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to call the organization that you used to work for and talk to someone that you didn't give me as a reference. That's what the best interviewers will do. Best interviewers will never make conclusions until all of the candidates are interviewed. What I said at the beginning about measuring and comparing candidates, how do I know that the next person I'm not going to meet is even better? I don't. So in the interview process, I'm going to take notes, I'm going to use my script and gather up information, and I will wait until I've seen everyone before I draw any conclusions. And last point in terms of what best interviewers do, if you think about it, if I've done 3,000 interviews, how many of those people do you think ended up getting the job? Honestly, it's going to be less than a thousand. Because for every person that got the job, I probably interviewed a minimum of five people. That means four people are not happy with me. I know this before I start the process, that I'm going to have 90% of the people that I see unhappy with my input into their uh, candidacy. But if I am respectful to them, if I treat them as not just candidates, but potential customers for the organization that I work for, and leave them that with that feeling, I want them to go away so that even if they don't get the job, that they're going to say, you know what, I didn't get the job, but it's a pretty good company to work for. And if someone else applies, they say, yeah, go try. I didn't get the job, but give it a try. It's a good. Said another way, if I leave them with a bad impression of the organization, and someone else says, oh, I got called in for the interview with this company. Oh, don't go there. No, it's not a good company. 
I had someone today talk to me about this, getting my advice on this. And, and so it is one of the hardest things to do, knowing that you're going to uh, stop probably 90% of the people from moving to the next step, but leave them with the positive impression. And a lot of the things that I'm describing in terms of good things to do are part of doing that. You're showing someone respect. Whatever the position is, you show people respect, even if they don't get what they want, they generally will respect you. We're going to flip it now. We've been talking about the interviewer. Let's talk about the interviewee, the candidate. This is you, say, if you're coming in for the interview. A good candidate, not a better candidate, not the best candidate, but a good candidate will build a rapport with the interviewer. Remember when I said do research on the interviewer? Part of the reason you're doing research on the interviewer is so that when the interview becomes less formal, you can talk less formally with them. That's helpful for your candidacy. Express a genuine interest and appreciation. It's not just a job. That's one of the reasons why you're asking people at the beginning, why do you want to work here? Because you want to separate the people who say, I need a job, I want a job, from those people who say, I have always wanted to work for your organization. For the past three years I've been following, I have two friends that work here. This is a place that I would be proud to work at. Ask, what are the next steps after the interview? Really, the message that you're communicating to the interviewer is that um, I want to go to the next step. Tell me what they are now. Maybe they know, maybe they don't know. But the mere asking of it is you're showing interest in the organization. Offer additional supporting information. Kind of relates to the previous point. Obtain permission from your references in advance. If you are going to use references, trust me, don't assume that they're going to be your references and don't assume that they're going to give you a good reference to make sure you check that information before you list their names. Keep applying. This one is absolutely crucial. Don't assume because you haven't heard anything that you've been rejected. Uh, applying may simply mean that at this time you weren't the right person. But maybe next time you would be. So don't assume no information is no. Keep applying. A good candidate will never ask the interviewer, tell me about the organization. We've talked about this already. A good candidate will never take rejection personally because it's not personal. Maybe it's got nothing to do with you, but maybe it's the person that you're going to be working for. Maybe that's the person that your personal character and chemistry would not work well with. It has nothing to do with you. Never take uh, rejection from a job interview process personally. Never say I'm a perfectionist. Remember the strength weakness question? That's one way people will try and twist a question around. Oh, I'm a perfectionist. What are, you, what are your weaknesses? Oh, everything I do I try to make perfect. Same thing. Perfect compared to what? To your own standards? Well, if they're your standards, of course you're a perfect. Everyone's a perfectionist to their own standards. It's an empty answer. And when you've done as many interviews as I had and seen too many people use this answer to the weakness question, you just it, it hurts you because I don't want to say you, you feel insulted, but it's 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 not the best way to represent yourself. Never say, just give me a chance. That happens a lot. You're in an interview. This is your chance. You've got the chance right now. For you being in the interview, there are probably 10, 20 people that didn't get the chance. You have it now. Take, it, take, take the opportunity to take advantage of the chance. Here's a tricky one. Better candidates, what will they do? They will actually avoid HR. What do I mean by that? Remember, this is a first interview. Your goal of the first interview is what? To get to the second interview. If you can target the person that you know who is the second interview, do it. Go around HR. And I said another way, if I have a manager come to me and say, I had the CV come to me, I really like what's on paper here, can you arrange an interview for me? I'm not going to say no, because I'm providing a service to that manager. Someone has gone around me, and I'm going to say yes. It's 
Think about that. Better candidate will take more control if the interview is weak. And this is a tricky one. Sometimes you will be interviewed by a weak interviewer, and maybe you need to actually assume more control of the interview. Give more information. Don't wait for them. If they're talking and talking and talking, and you know that you have something important to say, find a chance to say it. Better candidate will ask the interviewer questions at the end to get more information. So we're still at the end of the interview. This the interview is happening. Think about these questions. What's the weakest part of my application? You are now asking the interviewer questions. They're going to give you information to help you improve your chances in an interview in real time. What kind of person is the manager looking for? Again, you're asking this question to the organization. Based on the information you get back, tell them why you are that person. Right? It's right there. Why did the last candidate leave? What was the issue? And you say, oh, the person had a bad boss. Oh, you're getting good information. You need to know. These are probing questions that better candidates will, will use. How about this one? You've all done interviews before, maybe in your own organizations right now. Go back to the person who interviewed you and ask them for feedback. Remember when we interviewed last year? What was your initial impression? What did I do good? What did I do not so well? Get that information. Why not? Best candidates. The very best candidates will align themselves with the life cycle of the organization. What do I mean by that? Let's say that you consider yourself at the beginning of your career. You've just graduated from college. You've just achieved your professional designation. You're ready to explode into the job market. And you've gone to interview with an organization that is 100 years old and doing very standardized processes. And if you present yourself as someone who's ready to explode in a mature organization, it doesn't fit. Said another way, if you want that type of environment, those are the types of organizations you should be targeting. So align yourself with the life cycle of the organization. How about this one? Adjust to the culture of the interviewer. This one is a really subtle, challenging skill. But I learned this one myself in my own career from being an interviewer and having sort of a very structured process and realizing that for some cultures, that doesn't work. For some cultures, you need to actually engage the person on a more personal level first before they engage you at a more professional level. When you recognize the cultural differences, you can adjust how you interact and communicate with people. I'm not saying it's easy. Trust me, it is extremely challenging. And it's also potentially risky, too, because if you try and step into someone's culture and do it wrong, it can really offend people. But having the skill that is cultural intelligence in the era of globalization is incredibly empowering, not just for job interviews, but for your work and the workplace. Here's this one. This, this is the one that I recommend to so many people and so few people do. Practice interviewing and record yourself. So admittedly, you need two things. You need some recording device, and usually by that I mean a video recording device, and you need someone who will interview you. But there is no better way for you to get feedback as to how you present yourself than to go through, uh, as I say, a mock interview, record it, and then watch it and learn from it. For example, your own body language, nervous habits, we all have them. We all have things that we say. Words too much. In Arabic, yani. Right? Yani. In English, you know, um, when I studied Japanese, they said ano. Ano. When I first was trying to learn Japanese, what's this ano? Ano. Is that a number? Is it a pronoun? No, it's a pause. It's a yani. We all have these habits. These are types of things that you will see very quickly and clearly if you watch a video of yourself being interviewed. And your general energy and enthusiasm. So important. So just in closing, to recap, 
everything we've talked about so far, all interviewers are different. I don't pretend to stand here and speak for every interviewer out there, but I can guarantee you in terms of a good first interview that 80% of what I said will be consistent across what other interviewers will say. It's your job to sell yourself. Don't expect the interviewer to sell the job or find a job for you. At the end of the day, you do need to sell yourself. Interviews are a competition. Be different in that competition. That's, what, that's how you can separate yourself in that competition. Interviewing is a skill. That means it can be learned and improved upon. A lot of the information and suggestions I've given you today relate to doing just that. Interview the organization. It is a two-way process. Don't go to an interview and assume that the organization has everything. You have very little to offer. When you interview the organization, it gives the interviewer a sense of your self-confidence and your self-worth. And people want what other people want. And if you demonstrate that you're worthy, that energy comes out in the interview process. Believe you are the solution. Be the solution. My last point is just when I have a need to fill for a position, it is like my biggest headache. I have a problem. I need to find somewhere out there, somewhere outside these walls, is the ideal candidate. Every recruiter, every HR manager that's looking to fill a position has that problem. If you realize that you are that solution and you can solve that problem for that position, you are, you are making their lives so much easier. So do not sell yourself short. You are the solution. You just need to find the right organization to take advantage of your career. Okay, with that. Q&A. Thank you very much, Brad, for this amazing uh, webinar. Uh, and like he said, when you are trying to find a job, there is always this, like we call it, seven degree of uh, separation that there, for you to get to the right person to do the interview with, you have seven people that you need to get. So you need to uh, contact the person that you know, he will contact someone, and in that way, you get to this interview. So once you get to this interview, it's really important to take these tips in, in consideration and really apply them so in that way you'll be able to land the job that you want. Thank you Brad for, very much for this uh, webinar and now we are going to open it for questions and answers.